Okay, so here's my talk on nuclear power in space. Um, and it's the real thing, actually. Uh, this, is, this is what it looks like when you have a one gigawatt nuclear reactor uh, and put a, uh, a rocket engine on top of it. And it's what, this is what it looks like when you test it. And I'm very sure that people here were all thinking that this is exactly the kind of technology that would get them to Mars in, uh, I guess, the 1980s. Um, as we all know, that didn't quite happen. Uh, actually, this is more like the kind of thing that did happen. Uh, this is in current use, uh, just a heater unit in this case, and you will find those in a lot of um, space probes. And what this thing is, uh, this is the actual nuclear part. Uh, this is uh, plutonium inside, and there's a little bit of platinum and other stuff. Uh, coating it so you can touch it and uh, you don't have any plutonium on your hands because this is uh, plutonium 238. It's quite radioactive for very good reasons because the whole point about it is you want to heat something up and if you want to heat something up you better have it be really radioactive to have a good power output. Um, because it's so radioactive, you also have uh, all these uh, little shells here. Uh, this is essentially the same kind of material you've, you would find on the space shuttle nose cone that can withstand the high temperatures of re-entry when it comes from orbit. And that's actually necessary to prevent it from uh, yeah, just burning up in case something fails. Um, this is really small. It has about two grams of uh, of plutonium inside of it has a power output of one watt uh, in terms of heat and just for comparison that's roughly what you have when you have your cell phone in your pocket and it's running some kind of program at full power that's about one watt it gets kind of warm but uh, you won't burn your hand when you touch it uh, whole purpose for this is just to make sure that some components of the spacecraft don't freeze, especially batteries, because batteries cannot be recharged when they are frozen, when they are at some sub, like zero degrees centigrade or something like that. And uh, you will find those in a lot of spacecraft. Like, uh, for example, Galileo had 120 of those things. Um, Cassini, uh, besides the nuclear power source that we are just about to talk about uh, right next, had 81 heaters and the Huygens probe that landed on Titan, which was, which is a really, really cold place. I mean, it's it's so cold you have m liquid methane as lakes. Uh, that had 35 of those. Um, and MER, that's the Mars Exploration Rovers, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, there are actually just uh, uh, solar powered. I have a lot of solar panels on top of them and get their power from there. Still have eight of those because they cannot afford to have the batteries freezing, especially at night. Uh, and they cannot use it. They cannot simply use batteries to store power and run heaters overnight, especially in winter, because uh, Mars does have winters and they are uh, they're quite harsh. Uh, same goes for Mars Pathfinder Sojourner, that was a little rover about this big, really small, uh, that landed on Mars in, I think, 1996 or something, and still had three of them. Um, this is what we are more likely going to talk about when it comes to nuclear power in space these days. Um, this is New Horizon, uh, that's the probe that visited Pluto. And power comes all the way from here. Uh, by the way, this dish is about 2.4 meters across. Um, and that's the diagram of the kind of uh, radioisotope heat uh, 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 power generator that you would use. And it contains a lot of these modules here are not entirely consistent. Um, they contain plutonium, but actually uh, they also have a heat resistant shell. So just in case this thing had a malfunction uh, during launch uh, and it would fall back to Earth, they could be sure it would not break up and uh, yeah, break up and 
vaporized in the atmosphere. Um, what you will find here is that they use thermocouples to, uh, to generate power. That's one of the less efficient ways of producing power. Um, gets about 4% of the heat energy um, converted into electrical power and you get a few hundred watts of, out of them. And it's not very efficient, but it's very long lasting. The plutonium 238 has uh, a half-life of about 88 years, which is a long time. But then again, uh, keep in mind, it has when it launches, um, it has maximum power and falls off. So the whole power is derived from the fact that there is nuclear decay going on. So the radioactivity itself is the power source. And that means that at the ra right at launch, when it's most dangerous, uh, it's most radioactive. And that's why you uh, better protect yourself against, uh, against failed launches. Uh, better ways to generate uh, electricity out of heat, because that's all you do. You just heat something up. You have one side that's hot, you have one side that's cold, and thermoelectric elements uh, do exactly that. They, they have one side that's hot, one side that's cold, and because you put it in between, you get, new, you, you get electrical power. This is actually the same thing that happens in a Stirling engine like those. Uh, this is a very simple Stirling engine. Uh, you have a hot side, you have a cold side, you have a piston going back and forth in between them, and it's as simple as the piston uh, taking hot air. Uh, um, the uh, this is the display, so it, you can you can it can push uh, it can push out and leave air in here. At, but you st but it's not entirely uh, it's not entirely tight. But it's also not not like it doesn't have holes in it. So there can still be a force in between there. And essentially, gas here expands because it heats up. And pushes it that way and you can do it the other way around yeah it's a stirring engine I can't explain it in one minute as it seems but it's much more it's much more efficient you get an efficiency of about 25 percent so from the same amount of heat you can get about five or six times as much electricity as uh, from the thermocouples the problem is you have a moving part moving parts are bad because Everything that moves will eventually fail to move. It will get stuck. And there's nobody going to go up there uh, with a bottle of VD40 or something, uh, put some grease on it, and make sure it starts moving again. Uh, this thing has to keep running. And they were able to keep it running for a years at a time, but it's not quite as, quite as nice as the thermocouples. And that's why they have actually never been used in space so far. Uh, but there have been a lot of plans. Unfortunately, they have never materialized. They've never been financed. Um, there are other ways to generate electricity. Uh, in this case, uh, this was developed for, this specifically was developed for uh, solar power. Where you have, you have something that's hot. Uh, guess where this is coming from. The hot, the hot part is, of course, in this, ca in this case, it's the sun. Uh, in space, when you're far away from the sun, and uh, nuclear power is only practical these days when you're really far away from the sun, so the sun is so far away you don't get enough power from it, uh, you could use some kind of nuclear heat source because it's the only, the only kind of energy source you can find out there. And you can construct emitters. Now, if you have a black body radiator, some black body that's just uh, emitting infrared radiation. You get something like this. Uh, this is the spectrum of the sun, and it's not very easy to efficiently um, generate electricity from this kind of spectrum. Because what a solar cell does is essentially, you go somewhere here, and everything that's over there is discarded. You cannot get any energy out of it at all. And of the and it actually is only really efficient at this particular line where you where, that you choose, and you waste a lot of energy in the rest of it. Now, if you have something like this, and you can you can build an emitter that 
looks kind of like this, that has an emission spectrum that's similar to this by uh, essentially changing the surface properties. Um, you can just go here. There's nothing over here. And there's something in a small area over here. So it's more or less perfect. Now, it's not really perfect. Um, and the actual concepts go up to about 30% efficiency. But again, you have no moving parts. So there's a great potential over here to, to develop something that can actually last for a long time without maintenance, which is exactly the kind of thing you want to have in a space probe that has to run for decades at a time. Now, uh, where is the power coming from? Obviously, it's coming from, <laughs> from radioisotopes. And almost all of them have been used. Uh, your, your only uh, exception is cesium. Um, and what you can easily see is, uh, this is the power you get for each gram of material that you have, is the shorter your half-life is, the more power you can get out of it. That's very easy to explain because the half-life says how long it takes for all the stuff you have in there to radioactively decay. And if you have a short half-life, that means it decays very fast. Now, every single, every single atom that decays releases a set amount of energy. And when you have a short half-life, a lot of atoms will decay in a very short time. Hence, you get a lot of energy out of it. And the more energy per decay you get out of it, the more power you can get. So uh, the result is you have something like polonium-210 that was used by the Russians for the moon landers to keep them warm during the night. Uh, nights on moon are about two weeks, roughly. Uh, now, two weeks in absolute dark, no sunshine. It gets really, really cold. Uh, you want to have a heat source, and that's what they used. Uh, other possibilities are plutonium-238. Of course, the problem here is it has a really short half-life, but they just wanted to have a little rover to drive around on the moon for a couple of weeks, and that's exactly the kind of thing you want in this case. Uh, mostly alpha radiation. Now, that actually plays a role. Uh, there are other possibilities, like strontium-90, a short, uh, somewhat longer half-life than uh, polonium, but shorter than plutonium. And yeah, you have beta radiation. Now, beta radiation also means you get some neutrinos. Neutrinos also take up some of the energy, so this is this value here is not actually quite true. The neutrinos take some of that energy away. And neutrinos just go through everything. They can go through planets, not just through the material in your battery. So they will not contribute anything at all to your heating. Uh, so a bit of this gets lost. Uh, still, you can, you can expect to get something like 1.8 watts per gram. That's quite a lot. Uh, Cesium is obviously a terrible choice uh, because not a lot of energy and the gamma radiation it can also penetrate the material. It will not deposit a lot of energy within the battery, so it will not actually heat all of it up. But you still need shielding. You need a lot of shielding because gamma radiation, uh, once it penetrates the material, it can penetrate you and you don't really want that. Because, yeah, radiation is bad for your body, especially when you have a lot of it. Um, that's why alpha radiation is preferred for those applications because it can be shielded easily. It, it cannot even get through uh, a piece of paper or something like that. Problem of alpha radiation is if you have something like that within your body, uh, it doesn't matter that it can be, that, it can be uh, that you can shield it with a piece of paper because you don't have a piece of paper within your body. Um, so you really don't, don't want to ingest it. Alpha radiation, once it's inside of your body, is some of the uh, most vile stuff you, that you can have. Um, yeah. So where does all that stuff come from? Uh, and the reason is, the point is, it's nuclear weapons, really, uh, at least for polonium and plutonium. Um, Within nuclear weapons, you want to have an ignition source. Uh, during ignition, you want to have a lot of neutrons. And you can get neutrons from alpha radiation. 
and uh, some from alpha radiation and some light atoms when you have when you bombard something like beryllium with alpha radiation you get neutrons um, so pl polonium and later plutonium uh, were produced uh, specifically for the ignition source of a nuclear bomb so necessary facilities were around and then uh, when people were looking for energy sources uh, they happened to find oh well those guys from nuclear weapons already have some nice isotopes that we could use and so they used polonium and plutonium essentially um, these others like strontium is essentially left over new spent fuel so it's nuclear waste essentially part of nuclear waste that can be used for this because it's well it's radioactive guess what and uh because it's radioactive you can actually use the radioactivity to get some energy um americium is very similar uh americium actually uh comes from the decay of plutonium 241 and that's and that's beta emitter so it can change um, to americium and yeah americium has a long half-life uh, but there's a lot of it in spent fuel you can get it you can get it and ESA as far as I know is trying to get some more of it uh, they're trying to develop uh, a radioisotope uh, energy source from americium but so far they haven't done it has never it has never been used in space um, how do you get pl something like plutonium 238 well you can use neptunium uh, also part of spent fuel you put the neptunium inside a nuclear reactor it catches some neutrons it turns into neptunium 238 I'm sorry and uh, that decays to plutonium uh, very similar story. Uh, no, for for polonium, it's easier. You just take bismuth and bombard it with neutrons, and it turns into polonium 210, essentially. Well, okay, so that is that. Um, it's one way. It's not a particularly elegant way. It's very easy because all you need is you need the stuff. It hangs in there in inside your inside your battery, and it gets hot, and that's it. Uh, nothing else required. It's really that simple, and uh, that's why it's a really attractive option for something that just has to work. Uh, yeah, those things have been used extensively also for satellites in the 1960s, uh, like here for the transit satellites. Um, transit was an early navigation satellite, uh, similar to GPS, just not quite as accurate. And uh, this one in particular, Transit 5BN series, uh, resulted in this thing. Uh, we have something like health and safety laboratory on top of it and then uh, something titled global inventory and distribution of plutonium 238 from snap 9a which is the radioisotope uh, heater that it used um, you know something went wrong and the thing that went wrong was uh, this thing actually had a malfunction. The, the rocket that launched this actually had malfunction during launch and it distributed about one kilogram of plutonium 238 in the atmosphere. And people thought, well, that's a bad idea. We don't want that to repeat. Actually, uh, the amount that actually came down to Earth was rather limited, unfortunately. Uh, the result was something like that. The natural radioactivity in terms of alpha radiation was raised by one ten thousandth of the of the natural background. But still, people thought, no, we really don't want that. We don't want to repeat that. And that's why all the safeguards that I've shown you before have been implemented. Uh, and that's a good thing. Actually, even in the 1960s and 70s, people thought, yeah, yeah, we should be careful about this stuff. Uh, for example, during Apollo 13, they also had one of those sources on board and uh, yeah Apollo 13 you all know what happened it didn't quite reach the moon uh, and the radioisotope generator was supposed to land on the moon and stay there uh, that never got to happen so it re-entered into earth and it never broke up it never burned up it plunged into the sea essentially uh, and you can measure that 
same way that you measured uh, before with, uh, with the snap with the snap 9a source and that didn't happen it quite it worked it really does work and they they really cared about that in the 1960s now unfortunately as we all know uh, in the night ah, no sorry uh, still 1960s there are different ways to get energy from nuclear power uh, a reactor a real thing and uh, this is the real thing. Uh, sorry, this is the real thing. Uh, this is about as big as the reactor is. The rest is just uh, essentially in a nuclear power plant. This would be the cooling tower. Uh, this is a radiator that just gets rid of the waste heat. And uh, this was also using thermocouples uh, to get energy. It was really inefficient. Uh, Efficiency was 1.25%. Uh, this is a 40 kilowatt reactor and it generated 400 watts of energy. It's, it's really a, a huge waste of, of power actually, but the thing worked. And the way it worked is, uh, this inside here is the nuclear core. Uh, those are fuel pins. So this is the, actually the, the, the fuel rods that has the uranium inside of it. Uh, what you don't see here is liquid, uh, liquid sodium that was used to cool it, and it was a pump up here that pumped the that pumped the whole thing around because you have zero g, you have you have to find some way to move around your coolant uh, because you cannot use buoyancy or something like that, uh, and yeah, this moved essentially this moved the 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 hot sodium to the thermocouples on one side, on the hot side, and on the cold side uh, it was cooled by those huge radiators. Uh, the pump itself used about one third of the power or something like that, or one quarter, something on that, air, something of that size. And you can actually see how the whole thing works because uh, this here is our neutron reflectors. Uh, chain reaction inside the reactor releases neutrons in all directions and of course, it's used within the fuel pins to to split uh, to split other atoms, but some of the some of the neutrons escape, and when you have them like this, and they they are open, they they leave gaps, and a lot of the neutrons can, can escape. Now you can move these things around, and they will not leave gaps, and more of the neutrons will not escape and just come back to the reactor. And that's how the whole thing uh, can maintain uh, a chain reaction. And you can, you can use this to control the reactor. Uh, yeah. These days, uh, this is a modern paper. This is from, uh, I think, 2015. Uh, on uh, this thing. Uh, this is the Krusty Reactor Core Assembly. Uh, this is a hand here. Just to show you, this is about 11 centimeters in diameter, about as big as a CD. Uh, you have a hole inside of here. Uh, inside the hole, there will be a, uh, a control rod uh, that, as that absorbs neutrons. And actually, the design here is really elegant. There is no pump in here. Uh, it has heat pipes. Uh, heat pipes, essentially, you have a heat source <laughs> that's going to be the nuclear reactor. Uh, it will vaporize the uh, sodium that's inside of it and the vaporized sodium will go everywhere in the heat pipes uh, especially here to the hot side where there are a lot of Stirling motors that will produce the energy and it is going to uh, condense here because it takes away the energy it's going to cool down it's going to become liquid and within the heat pipes there's um, uh, uh, I forgot the English word for that. Uh, <laughs> there's a wick. Uh, a wick, that's the same thing that you have in the candle uh, that just uses capillary force to, to, move the, to move the liquid sodium back to the core. So it all uses capillary force. It works in zero G. It doesn't require a pump. There's no pump that can fail. There's no pump that can... Uh, that needs power uh, really quite an elegant solution for this kind of for this kind of thing um, especially since uh, 
with this reactor. This one failed within 43 days after an electrical failure and they could, uh, yeah, they had to shut it down and they couldn't use the, the satellite anymore. Actually, a really interesting satellite that they used this on because it had the very first ion engines on board. Actually, two types. I think one used mercury and the other would use cesium. Uh, and they actually worked back in the 1960s. Um, of course, this one here is a mock-up. Uh, this is, as far as I know, this is uranium-238. Uh, the real thing that's actually being used right now, that's in testing right now, uh, uses 90% enriched uranium uh, with some uh, molybdenum. That's uh, essentially a well-proven technology from research reactors uh, that's being used here. And you can see the heat pipes here. These heat pipes are will yeah just take the energy that's that's produced within the reactor that that's the heat in the in the core away to uh, the stirring engines uh, that's how it's going to be done and uh, the neat thing about this kind of reactor is uh, the reactor core itself uh, cannot maintain uh, a chain reaction uh, it's a, it's the same again same thing we talked about before um, neutrons from the reactor core escape and because they escape there cannot be a chain reaction uh, not quite anyway and you need a good reflector to get them back inside the core and that's here uh, and that core that that reflector will be uh, moved into the uh, no the core will be moved into the into the reflector or vice versa it's the same thing anyway and um, Without that, without that step, uh, the core cannot maintain any kind of nuclear chain reaction, even if you withdraw the control rod or anything. So it's actually, a, it's about the safest you can get as far as nuclear reactors are concerned, especially at launch. Uh, one of the major problems people had with One of the major concerns people have with nuclear reactors is that during launch they may drop intact into water. And water is a really good neutron reflector, but it's not quite as good as this stuff. This stuff is uh, beryllium, and so they can, so they essentially built this whole thing so that beryllium is just about enough, a good enough reflector to get a nuclear chain reaction, but water is not good enough to get a chain reaction. And so they can be really sure that uh, if there's any kind of failure with the rocket and plunges into the sea, nothing's going to happen. Um, this part here, uh, the upper part here, is not part of the reactor. This is a vacuum chamber because they want to test the whole thing in vacuum. Uh, that's essentially just the test stand that they want to test it on. Okay, now back to the thing we were starting with. This is the 1960s. So, what we've seen so far, this, uh, oh, by the way, this whole thing is a four kilowatt reactor. Uh, really small. It's about the smallest kind of reactor you can you can find anywhere, and it will produce about one kilowatt of power. Uh, just a reminder: the last one had about ten times as much power and half as much energy came, half as much electricity coming out of it. So a lot more efficient uh, than what they used in, this, in the 1960s, uh, and a lot less complex. Uh, all you really have to do is to move the reflector and uh, move a control rod that will be inside the core uh, out of it to start it and then just leave it running. That's the plan anyway. They want to keep it as simple as, as reasonably possible to, to not have any kind of problems. Now let's get to the fun part. Uh, the fun part, uh, in, in one way or another, depends on your kind of humor, uh, is the 1960s. Uh, as I said, this is a one gigawatt nuclear reactor, and what they do is essentially they produce a lot of heat. A lot of heat, and, and we're talking about 2,000 degrees Celsius. And they heat up uh, liquid hydrogen with it and push this out through a rocket nozzle. And the whole contraption is actually more effective than, uh, more efficient than a normal, uh, uh, some kind of normal rocket engine. Um, 
because actually what you do in in a in a rocket engine is you burn one thing with another thing it combines becomes something heavier and then you blow it out now if you if you remember your physics lectures um <coughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, in physics, temperature is essentially, yeah, temperatures are essentially defined as the amount of energy that ev that each molecule of gas uh, has. So if you have a high if you have really heavy molecules in the, in a gas at a certain temperature those heavy molecules will move slower than light molecules and what you actually want in an efficient uh, rocket engine is fast moving molecules and so you want to have the lightest molecules you can find and that's hydrogen um yeah and you heat them up really really high and you get something that's about twice as efficient as a regular hydrogen engine uh, where you burn the hydrogen with oxygen and the whole thing suddenly becomes water and water is about nine times as heavy as regular hydrogen uh, yeah so that's what it looks like uh, that's kind of like the idea from the inside and it's very similar to to every other nuclear reactor actually there's a shield here uh, because you don't want to fry anything that's on the other side of the nozzle uh, lots of nuclear ra uh, lots of radiation is released during the uh, during the operation of the nuclear reactor because um, nuclear fission releases a lot of neutrons and hard gamma rays and you want to shield this um, there are some there are control rods. Those control rods can be turned around. One side, in this case, one side absorbs neutrons, the other reflects neutrons. So this is a more efficient, uh, much more efficient way to do this than uh, the first reactor that, that I've shown where you just open up the reflector. This one actually has, a, uh, has an absorber on the other side. Uh, and uh, yeah. That's how you can, can control uh, the operation of this reactor. It's quite involved, actually, um, because the thing you're trying to heat up is hydrogen, and hydrogen um, can moderate a, a nuclear chain reaction. It's the same thing that happens in, say, a light water reactor or something like that. And there you have water inside of the reactor that moderates the chain reaction. Uh, in this case, uh, it's the same thing. And uh, the thing that, that moderates the neutrons in water is the hydrogen. And here you have, you, have the, you have pure hydrogen, so it influences a lot about the chain reaction. And uh, this actually had to be controlled, and the, you have to control this whole thing uh, during the operation of the engine. And that was a lot of the reason why it had been tested, and tested quite a lot. Uh, I'm really sorry that this doesn't quite show up fully. I, I hope you can download the whole thing uh, afterwards. Yeah, but we ran in 1960s. You remember what people did in 1960s, especially in the US uh, and uh, USSR? They tested nuclear weapons. Uh, and I, I show these slides uh, for good reason because there's no way you can explain the next slide unless you keep th in mind that this was what was going on at the same time. Uh, by the way, this is a nuclear, this is uh, a nuclear bomb going off, uh, and see as seen from Las Vegas. So you could, so there were cafes in Las Vegas where you could see uh, tests of nuclear bombs going off. And yeah, okay, this is uh, what it looks like when you construct a nuclear reactor in such a way that it is highly unstable and where it can turn the control rods even faster than you usually can, about a hundred times as fast. And that's the kind of thing you really, really don't do to nuclear reactors without the nuclear reaction uh, becoming essentially out of control. And that's what happened here. Uh, this is called, oh yeah, I'm sorry if 
sorry, that doesn't show, it com show up completely. Kiwi TNT, the transient nuclear test. Uh, it released uh, the equivalent of 2.2 tons of TNT. Uh, about 0.01% of the fallout was released here uh, as during the very first uh, nuclear bomb uh, test. Yeah, that was done. Uh, one reason is they want to know what happens if this thing falls into water uh, intact without falling apart uh, before that. Uh, because then, yeah, you, you have the same problem I was talking about before. Water is a really good neutron reflector and it might go super critical on you and you don't want that. Or at least you want to know what happens if that happens. And the other is uh, this little paper here. A comparison of nuclear and explosive destruct concepts for nuclear rocket engines. So uh, if something goes wrong, you might want to blow up the engine before it can fall into water. And uh, you will be happy to uh, hear that they found out that, yeah, uh, doing this with a nuclear explosion is actually a really bad idea. Uh, why they did it, I'm, I'm, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I kind of... I don't. I mean, I'm. I'm not really certain what they were thinking. Um, they tested a lot of reactors, and uh, to give you a size comparison, this is a, this is Kiwi B. That's the one that that we saw before, one gigawatt roughly. That was A in the uh, late 50s, uh, 1960 had been tested already. Uh, keep in mind, 1960. That was before. A before uh, anybody ever flew into space. And they were building them bigger. This one is Phoebus II. That one actually worked and it had been tested in 1967. Uh, and it was a five gigawatt reactor and it ran at that power level. And uh, I am happy to report they really didn't care. They didn't care that the fuel in there uh, broke up during operation. Uh, actually, at the kind of temperatures you want to have here, above 2000 degrees, uh, there's essentially no material that will withstand this for any kind of time. And it will slowly erode. Uh, they've gotten better with time. At first, they, they broke up quite readily. Later, uh, they, they had better materials and the erosion rates became the came down and a lot less radioactive uh, material was released um, but yeah whatever was released came out of here and was released straight into the environment so later you had tests like this one uh, in, in 1972 and you will notice this one doesn't have 5000 megawatts this one has 44 megawatts it's really small com in comparison, so 100, and uh, I've marked this one here, it was the only test ever with filtered exhaust. So this one was the only, w the only test they ever did, and with a really small reactor, about 1% one size, one the size of the largest reactor they tested, where they actually uh, filtered the exhaust of the engine uh, of the radioactive debris that came out of it. Uh, yes, they, they, they really didn't care too much about the environment there. Uh, they were in the desert anyway, so um, I guess not too many people suffered from it, but it was a really bad idea. Um, this was the first test that they, that they did filtered, and it was, uh, I think, as far as I know, this was the last test ever that was done with that kind of nuclear engine. And uh, summer 1972, well, there was something in, the, in, in 1972 that was the last flight of the Apollo program. That's when they canceled the moon flights. And with the moon flights, they also canceled any plans to fly to Mars. And so they didn't need any kind of engine like this that's super efficient and might make it a bit easier to go to Mars. And yeah, that's when they stopped the program. Of course, none of that ever stopped anybody from having fun before that. And, uh, you know, that kind of fun, I mean. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, that was the kind of engine they proposed to use for the Mars flights, essentially. Uh, the thrust is about twice as much as the upper stage of Ariane 6. Uh, 
ISP is a measure of the efficiency and is, it's essentially twice as high as a good hydrogen engine. Uh, yeah. Here's uh, uh, you can you can go look for look for this uh, and and find a lot more out, find out a lot more about the whole program. Uh, yeah, it's essentially the same thing I I already said. Uh, this one is the nozzle, so this is really the business end of the of the engine. Uh, this is the reactor core. There are the reflectors. Here's the shield that shields the that shields the uh, rest of the rocket and the spacecraft from uh, from radiation. And those are turbo pumps. The turbo pumps are responsible for pumping uh, the hydrogen into the core. Uh, and yeah, I'm I'm really sorry, but I copied this straight from a NASA document. And you all know what NASA is like. Yeah, they use pounds. They use uh, uh, pounds per square inch for for pressures, stuff like that. Uh, and you can actually do some calculations though with this, and and show that they needed about 50 kilograms of um, of hydrogen to be pumped through this reactor each second, and this actually quite requires quite some powerful pumps. And those pumps are actually also run from the reactor by taking some of the some of the hydrogen they heated up through this line, uh, as far as I know, and bring it back to the bring it back. To, to drive some turbo pumps and keep the process running. Okay, there was a lot more fun being had in theory at least. Um, because you see, with that kind of engine you have a problem. The problem is you want to heat up your hydrogen as high as possible. Uh, the higher you heat it up, the more efficient the engine becomes. The problem is, uh, if you heat up the core uh, any more than about 2,200 degrees or something like that, it's not just going to slowly erode, it's just going to melt and then it's going to vaporize. And uh, so you cannot use this kind of concept for that. But people had ideas. Uh, criticality studies of a nuclear light bulb engine. Now, what's a light bulb? <laughs> light bulb sounds quite funny. Uh, how how do you, how do you uh, uh, get a nuclear reactor with a light bulb? Well, let me tell you. Um, you may have heard about uh, uranium enrichment through uh, gas centrifuges. Well. Uh, gas centrifuges means you have to have gas and you can actually turn uranium into gas uh, by turning it into uranium fluoride that turns into a gas quite easily and you can make a reactor out of that so instead of having uh, some, some uranium rods or something like that you have a gas and of course you can heat up your gas as high as you like uh, in this case about 15,000 degrees now at 15,000 degrees, uh, it will just glow, and it will not just glow as like the sun. This is actually three times as hot as the sun, so it will glow in, in ultraviolet light. And now they had the idea, okay, let's surround those chambers with quartz. Quartz is transparent to ultraviolet light, and then, so, so it can radiate out. The whole energy is radiated out as light. And then you put all your hydrogen along with some uh, little particles that absorb the, the ultraviolet light and heat it up uh, on the outside. And you can actually reach quite a lot higher temperatures and it can get about three times the efficiency of the other engine uh, with that kind of technology. Uh, I'm happy to report, in this case generally happy to report, this has never been tested. Um, so. In theory, it should work. It really, really should. But uh, yeah, it has never been tested, and I'm not sure it would be a clever idea to test that. Uh, yeah. Next thing. Uh, even happier. Uh, the uranium. I mean, when you read something like uranium plasma, you know you're in for something. And uh, the idea here is to have a plasma of uranium inside of the reactor and have gaseous uh, hydrogen on the outside of it and just not have any kind of quartz uh, in, in between them so you can heat up your hydrogen even more.
The problem is, uh, part of your uranium plasma will always escape along with the rest of it, so you will have radioactive exhaust, quite radioactive exhaust actually. Uh, all this one too, I'm happy to report, has never been tested or built. Um, again, here the idea is you have a critical mass on the inside, you have a neutron reflector, uh, barium oxide in this case, on the outside, you have your nozzle, your rocket nozzle, Somewhere here, you have a pump here, uh, and that's the idea. Is uh, the the concept is quite easy. Um, it has never been actually built, and if you want to build it, it's going to be a hell of a lot more complicated than that. Okay, last slide of this talk, uh, second to last actually. Uh, when you see the word detonation. Uh, it's uh, even worse than uranium plasma, I guess. Uh, this is actually from Zubrin. Zubrin is, the ge is a guy who was uh, looking for technology um, to go to Mars as fast as possible. So he re really didn't care. And uh, his idea was, well, how about we have a supercritical mixture of uranium and, uh, and water but mix it with some kind of neutron absorber so it doesn't really get critical anywhere here. And then you pump it out of the absorbers so it's just with itself and it re can reach critical mass. You can pump it somewhere outside. You have some, you have some uh, neutron reflectors in here. And the whole point, the whole idea here is to have this so super critical that it's inevitably going to have a chain reaction that's uncontrolled. But uh, it's it's uncontrolled in a way that is um, well. It, it, it's going to take a little bit of time until it gets out of control. And if you pump it fast enough, it will only get out of control once it is outside. And you have a nozzle uh, on the left and right side of it, and so you can have a detonation and redirect the detonation to to get your exhaust gases. Uh, uh, pointing away from your um, from your rocket and it's actually it would actually be really quite efficient I wouldn't want to be on board when you test this thing uh, called nuclear salt water rockets uh, it's 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 real fun I can tell you <laughs> at least as a concept not as something you want to use oh yeah one more uh, I almost forgot uh, fission fragment nuclear reactors this thing dispenses with the idea of using of heating up hydrogen. Why heat up hydrogen? Heating something up is going to be inefficient. Actually, you're splitting atoms, and uh, when you split atoms, the, the two atoms that result will go in, in two directions at really high speeds. So how about using those two atoms coming out of the splitting of the atom uh, to drive your spaceship? Um, that has that idea had been developed somewhere in sometime in the 70s and uh, this one is actually more current sometime in the 2000s uh, and you, do, you essentially take those those two atoms and redirect them with magnetic fields out of the out of the engine and uh, you can in theory you could use this to get somewhere to 1% of light speed with uh, with a fairly conventional <coughs> almost conventional um, uh, technology at least in terms of physics uh, it's it's quite uh, it's well known yeah this is project Orion and if anybody wants me to t wants uh, me to talk about project Orion and you don't want to look it up yourself uh, well be my guest you can ask me otherwise thanks a lot So, any questions? <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, are you involved in this kind of research? No, not actually. Oh, but you can find a lot of papers on this on the internet. It um, essentially use uh, scholar google.com and you can find all kinds of papers on these concepts. Uh, as soon as you start looking for them, you will find a lot of them uh, in, in some detail. And, but I've been dealing with nuclear power for a long time. I've also dealt with spaceflight for a long time. So 
Um, yeah, uh, it's been a hobby of mine, so yeah, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> So thank you for the talk. Yeah. Uh, you said that it's best to use a light propellant like hydrogen. Yeah. Um, but do I understand it correctly that if you use a heavy propellant, uh, that the impulse is still the same, but the particles are slower but heavier? Um, yes, but your efficiency goes down. Uh, um, uh, the, the impulse is still the same, yes. Uh, but you need more you need to throw a heavier mass out to get the same reaction on the other side um, You see if you, if you have uh, say a, If you have like one ton here and you have one kilogram of mass and you shoot it on the out of on the other side with say 1,000 meters per second uh, Your one ton mass will move with uh, one meter per second in the other direction, right? You know, it's 1,000 meters per second in that direction, one thousandth of the mass, so this one moves one meter per second in that direction. Now, you try the same with uh, 10 kilograms at 100 meters per second in the other direction. You still get one meter per second, but now you have wasted 10 kilograms instead of one kilogram. So, yeah. So you just lose your propellant faster. Exactly. And that means you cannot reach uh, as high of an end, as high of a speed at the very end when you're out of propellant. Um, was the uh, cost of this uh, actually competitive? Uh, if you if we uh, take a p put away all the env uh, environmental and security and stuff <laughs> like this, just uh, assume issues, yes. it, it works and there is uh, no big contamination, but just it works. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, they spent about 12 billion dollars in our money, uh, inflation adjusted. It's about 12 billion dollars, as far as I know. Uh, and they got to essentially to the point where they were ready to start building a working engine uh, if anybody had said okay let's build one so the R&D was finished more or less uh, to answer your question actually not really no uh, at least as far as uh, as far as you, you if you want to go to Mars you can just use conventional fuels and just build a bigger rocket and you're fine it's yeah, it was the 19, it was the 1970s, uh, 60s and 50s, and they, they want to have as, as efficient an engine as possible because they didn't just want to go to Mars, they also want to go further out, and so then uh, it's like... Yeah, uh, uh, and there is no uh, other level, let's say, uh, something which you can't absolutely not achieve with a conventional uh, rocket where you could say, okay, this is, uh, this is something if you want to go to, let's say, Alpha Centauri or something like this, where yeah. you can say, okay, this can scale up uh, to some uh, unlimited thing. Uh, not unlimited, but, but, but to the point of getting within one or two percent or something like that of light speed, yes. Okay. <laughs> In theory. <laughs> Uh, especially this thing. Uh, also, I mean, this one here, bec like almost 10,000 10, seconds. That means it me uh, it moves out with a hundred thousand. Yes, a uh, hundred thousand meters per second. No, that's not enough. Uh, yeah, you actually need that one uh, because the the atoms went from when you split uranium, the atoms move with uh, some fraction of light speed. Uh, yeah, uh, just to give you a hint, the idea here is uh, this is called the pusher plate and you have a shock absorber. Uh, the shock that this is supposed to absorb is from a nuclear bomb. And the idea is to throw a nuclear bomb out here, have it explode behind it and uh, uh, use the push from the explosion to drive this whole thing forward. <laughs> That's Project Orion. Exactly. Yeah. 
Exactly. You're writing on shockwaves of nuclear explosions. Uh, you can read up on it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the talk. Yep. And see you tomorrow. This is the last talk for today. Thanks.